Hello and welcome to another GMF Talk with me, Liz Show. Today we'll talk about the power and influence of social media. We want to take a closer look at how social networks need to change to reduce potential harm to their users. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Frances Haugen. She is a former Facebook employee and a whistleblower. She has warned extensively about how Facebook is allowing divisive content, misinformation, hate speech to thrive on the platform because that is the type of content that makes people stay around longer. Frances Haugen, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for inviting me. So you left Facebook about a year ago. Do you still use Facebook and Instagram? I, I do. I have an Instagram account. Um, I don't actively use my Facebook account because I assume at some point they will arbitrarily get rid of it for me. So I try not to invest too much in it. Um, I do use Instagram, though, for documenting kind of like the, the, the more fun moments on um, the work I do. Um, I'm also very active on Twitter. I'm, I, sometimes people, I think, misinterpret my criticisms of saying uh, that you should leave social media. I'm not, I'm not, I actually don't believe people should have to make a, like an, a yes, no choice, right? Like a binary choice. The question is really more about, does the public have a right to weigh in on um, conflicts of interest inside the company, right? Because the real problem is that Facebook has had lots and lots of little choices it can make around, you know, um, you know small trade-offs, like major reductions in, um, violence, nudity, hate speech, misinformation versus very small slivers of profit. And because of the way the company is currently set up, it, it keeps consistently making choices to protect um, those slivers of profit. And if you had a teenage daughter, would you allow her to be on social media? And if yes, under what conditions? I strongly support there's a, a movement in the United States called Wait for Eight. Um, and Wait for Eight, it says like you should wait until eighth grade, um, which is about 14 years old before you give your kid a phone. Like they have a, a process where kids in kindergarten, like a first year of school, sign their family sign a pledge saying, we're going to wait for eight. Um, because when we do those kinds of, of uh, community actions, um, it makes it easier for each of the individuals involved to wait for eight. So I, I think if I had a kid that was under 14, I would not give them a phone. Um, and even under 16, I don't, I don't think social media is a good idea. Um, it becomes a lot harder of a choice. Like I fully recognize how difficult it is to be a parent these days. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure from other, other kids for people to be on social media. But the, the reality is that when you look at Facebook's research, it says like problematic use, which is, you know, what, um, when people say they, they can't control their usage and they know it's harming their work, their health, um, or their schoolwork, um, uh, you know, that peaks at 14. And so it's one of these things where uh, I think it's our current relationship with social media and children isn't very humane to anyone involved. And so I, I personally would not allow an under 16 year old to use social media. We need to talk about algorithms. I know you're an expert on this issue. You are a computer engineer. You've worked to optimize algorithms of not only Facebook, but also before that Google, Yelp, Pinterest, so algorithms, how powerful are they? People who actually work on, um, on, on these kinds of algorithms, they call them machine learning because all the machines are doing is they're learning patterns. They can only learn patterns that we ask them to learn. And the challenge here is that uh, all, all algorithmic systems have biases because they're, not, they're only approximations of what we want. They're not like actually what we want. Um, and so the question here is whether or not the public has a right to um, be able to inspect those algorithms, whether or not it has the right to say, hey, we believe there is X, Y, Z concern. Could you please check? Um, and to say like, oh, we found a problem. We would like you to actually invest in fixing them. Because like I said before, these algorithms are just hill climbers, right? Unless you tell them explicitly to care about democracy, to care about um, have, having good speech, have the opportunity to respond to bad speech. Because the problem here is not bad people or bad, bad ideas. It's that these systems are giving the most reach to the most divisive and extreme ideas. Can you give some examples of what exactly you mean by the system giving more reach to extreme content? Yeah. So back in 2018, Facebook was facing a problem. Over the course of uh, a period of time, the amount of content being produced on their system was going down. 
Facebook tried a whole bunch of different things to try to get you to produce more content. And the only thing they found that worked was getting you more little hits of dopamine. So every time you get a like, a comment, a reshare, it in increases the chance that you'll produce more content in the future. So instead of just optimizing for like, will you stick around? Uh, they started optimizing for engagement. The only problem was that, you know, I don't know, 75 years of social science research has said the shortest path to a click is hate, right? The easiest way to in, 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 uh, motivate someone to action is, is anger. Um, and what they found very rapidly was they sent researchers into Europe for in preparation for the European parliamentary election, elections, the EU level. And they found across Europe on the left and on the right, the political parties were saying, hey, we know you changed the algorithm. It used to be we could put out a white paper on our agricultural policy. And it's not like it got the most comments or the most, you know, the most likes. Well, we could see from the statistics, it got read. And the reality is most of democracy is about things like agricultural policy. They said, now when we share it, we get crickets. Like there's no engagement or like there's no distribution. And it's because um, they're like, we are stuck running <coughs> issues that we know our constituents don't like. Right, like we we have to run divisive extreme positions now. We have to use language that we know is polarizing because otherwise we don't get that engagement that the, the algorithm is looking for. Now, I want us to look at journalism for a minute because our work as journalists is also evaluated by how much engagement it gets. We're always like, okay, which video has the most views, the most shares, most likes? How many people commented on it? So are we journalists also focusing on the wrong numbers and kind of perpetuating the system? There's been really good research by people like Rene DeResta that talk about the idea of that we can't think of journalism and social media as separate systems. We have to think of them as integrated systems. That um, when uh, platforms uh, are actively given data on these kinds of things, it can, it can um, erode other ways of evaluating um, speech. So uh, there's an, a document in the disclosures from BuzzFeed where BuzzFeed wrote to Facebook and said, hey, we've been looking at wh what, which, which uh, of our articles gets the most distribution on your system. And these are like the stories we're least proud of. You know, they play on racial stereotypes. They pit people against each other. Um, we think there's a problem with your algorithm. So there's definitely is a thing of that when we focus on really clean metrics, we may not be actually measuring the thing that we care about. And we have to be really careful. Yes, uh, not everything that is measured is meaningful and not everything that is meaningful is measured. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree. Like we can't get reductive about evaluating what is good and bad. Let's look into the future. The theme of this year's Global Media Forum is shaping tomorrow now. You say that you wanna be an advocate for social media that brings out the best in humanity. What would an ideal social network look like to you? In general, I believe in human scale social media, that the problems that we're facing right now with Facebook, the things that actually stoke violence, are because we Facebook is biased towards systems that are governed by algorithms. We're designing software that is human scale that can be mo modulated by humans. So I'll give you a really quick example. There are things called Discord servers. So a Discord server is very much like IRC or like Slack. You know, it's a place where information is chronologically ordered. So it's the, in the order of the conversation, just like you and me talking. Like we don't get to decide which sentence in this conversation is going to get blasted out to everyone. You know, it's a conversation. Um, you can have a Discord server with tens of thousands of people on it. And when the conversation gets too busy, it breaks off into rooms, just like at a conference. We have models of how to facilitate human communication and human connection that are human scaled. Thank you very much, Francis Haugen, and all the best to you and for the work that you do. And thank you very much for watching this GMF Talk with Francis Haugen. We have more great content, so check it out on our channel and please subscribe if you haven't done so. I'm Liz Show, hoping to see you again next time. Have a great day.